Good rainy Tuesday morning. Must be raining because the cat's wet. Hi, hi. Working with um, the microwave oven-based tube tester. It's finished except for I've used the original microwave oven transformer with uh, a half-wave rectified output. And it only goes to about 1,200 volts at full line volt, which I need 2,000. So it's just short on voltage, but I'm only using half the cycle. So I'm modifying it now to uh, make it a full wave uh, output, which will be max of 2400 peak. But there are questions. There are a couple websites online that are prominent about using these microwave oven transformers. The information on the websites is wrong, like pretty much everything else you'll find on hobby websites on the internet. The false names that have been invented is that somehow the transformer is, is cheap or defective or no good, and the, the secondary high voltage is, is connected to the frame because the paper, insulating paper is insufficient and just a bunch of unsupported myth. So to understand this, we're going to go over the original power supply design and then go forward to how I've modified it by floating the high voltage secondary. And how that's actually an improvement and i'll show you the the layout and design of the high voltage supply in here this is important because it's a deadly supply so the original microwave oven revolves around the magnetron if you notice the microwave anode at the top that's an rf gasket that gasket prevents leakage into this cavity here Notice only two terminals on the magnetron. And the magnetron is a vacuum tube and it has a anode voltage and a cathode voltage and a heater. That's three terminals. How are they getting away with only two terminals? Here's the rectifier assembly. There are multiple rectifiers inside. I cannot read it with my DMM on diode test scale and that's 10 volt max. So the forward drop of that is probably more than 10 volts. So there may be six or eight or 10 individual diodes inside there. That's done for high voltage. So if each one has a drop of, of a volt, then there might be multiple adding up to some forward voltage drop. This gets warm in operation, so there's some drop inside. And that's all there is for the supposed filter capacitor. And it is, and it isn't. Notice it's 0 0.85 microfarad, 2100 volts AC. Doesn't that remind us of, of a motor start capacitor? Well, yes, that's, that's how a start cap would be rated. Also notice the symbol, capacitor with an internal 10 megohm bleeder. Some of the old microwaves had the bleeder externally. That's a dangerous thing to do because if, a, if the bleeder is disconnected, a wire breaks and the capacitor doesn't discharge. And a co-worker in a TV shop years back that I worked with almost died because he got lit up by one of these. So be very careful. The Much of the myth about these transformers revolves around the fact that originally you see that little piece of plastic that's a piece of plastic house siding I cut so it goes down in between the windings and the core to stabilize it and I've floated the secondary winding call it, call it the minus side if you want or the frame side I've floated that with a screw make connections that go in the background to the cathode terminal to the tube and over to the high voltage filtering block One of these websites has made up the myth that the secondary is so-called grounded to the core because the insulating paper is not sufficient, so they, so they ground it to the core to make it the same potential. That's not only false, but grossly contradictory. Connecting that secondary to the core increases the voltage stress across the paper, which, by the way, is far more than enough 
This is not just ordinary paper. It's a paper that's impregnated with a sealant, especially in the context of a microwave oven that heats food and makes a lot of moisture so the paper doesn't get soaked and then arc over. But the person making that claim did nothing to try to find the specs on paper like this. And I can assure you that paper is going to be good for about 15 kV <clears throat> uh, polystyrene, nylon, uh, HD, and low-density polyethylene, these, these engineering plastics. They're rated at 15, 20 some thousand volts per mil per thousandths of an inch. So whoever said this about this paper being sufficient is simply talking out there, you know what? I'm trying to rationalize why that's connected like that. The reason that they rivet, there was a rivet that went all the way through the thickness of that transformer. <clears throat> the head was on one side here. See a little hole there. All the way through, <clears throat> and this ring terminal was riveted fast to this. The purpose for that is for the magnetron because the magnetron fits into the cavity like this uh, there it was like that there are two terminals for the filament one terminal is the high voltage to the cathode inside this filtering enclosure there's uh, chokes in here and the heater leads and the other connection is this case. So, uh, see, with this being microwave and this being in the cavity, we cannot run a wire out of here. Can't do it. So there's no way to connect to the anode. So the anode connection is through here. And the cathode connection is here or vice versa. It's not really relevant which. And you can see the, the magnets in there so that's why the transformer is so-called ground to the core the secondary winding is common <clears throat> to the core the core is fastened to the metal chassis the metal chassis is is uh, welded to this plate <clears throat> that plate is what this rests on with screws through here and that completes a circuit for the high voltage there's no myth and no mystery to why the Secondary winding is common to the core. That's the reason. There's a myth that says that the reason for that is to compensate for the paper that's insufficient insulation. Well, here's a schematic diagram of the bottom of the high voltage winding that's tied to the core here. And then that goes out. This is the chassis here. If there's a voltage potential <clears throat> between here, let's say this is plus, and the core, then the paper is here to isolate it. In reality, that's not the case here. Because in reality, these, these windings are bobbin wound and placed over the core. This terminal here is this terminal here, and it's way out here isolated from the core. So... There's really no, no such thing as, as needing insulation from here when this wire wraps around along the sides of the transformer, yes. But the point being that the other end of the winding is on the inside of this winding here. And it's close to the E. This is in two sections of an E core. And there's part of the core that goes down through the center of the transformer here. So that's here. So the so-called high voltage out is, is sticking out here in the air. And that's this one. But that is insulated from the core here by this paper. So there's a voltage potential from here to here because of this connection with the other end of the winding. The winding potential is from here to here. The paper isolates and insulates this uh, what I've termed V sub 2 from the core the cores at V sub 1 
So the difference in voltage between this end of the winding and the core, which is V sub 1, is 0 because it's a short circuit. That puts all the voltage of that winding at V sub 2 between here and here. So the full voltage of the winding is being insulated by that piece of paper. <clears throat> when that secondary winding is floated, then neither of these potentials is connected to the core. There's a potential between here and here as a result of a potential from here to here. Now there are two thicknesses of paper between this potential instead of one because this is floating. So there's a V1 potential from here to here, the same as there's a V2 potential from here to here. And the total is V1 plus V2. Well, it's that's a given. But notice it's V1 plus V2. It's not all V2 with V1 being zero. So this has the effect of isolating with a double thickness of paper and doubling whatever air gaps there are. So what this uneducated person has stated about the grounding the core because the paper is insufficient is completely contradictory. There is more voltage isolation with a secondary floated. Now on to the capacitor question. See the difference? There's a bank of seven electrolytics in the back and I'm adding two more. The seven were in series for a half wave supply. I've got to split that for a voltage doubler, so I've got to add another capacitor. So just mechanics. But notice the difference in volume. This was the original capacitor. There's 38 microfarad <clears throat> in here. That's that's kind of typical for, for RF power amplifier plate supplies. So if that's what's necessary to make a, a nice filtered 2kV plus supply, how are they getting away with 0.85 microfarad? That, that can't possibly filter that. Well, that's right. With this arranged as a half-way supply at max, at 120 volts AC on a primary, the output DC was 1250. That's, that's not enough for the magnetron. For half wave supply. So, how is it they're using one diode and getting 2 kV? And I can assure you it's 2 kV. I've measured back in the day, I've worked on a lot of microwaves with a high voltage probe, measured 2 kV or a bit plus on these kinds of capacitors, and there's more voltage there than that. Well, the trick is that this is an old, this is type of power supply from the old tube type TVs. They're characterized by the secondary of the transformer coming out and going through a capacitor. <clears throat> and what that is is a very simple, inexpensive voltage doubler. If you'll notice when microwave ovens run, they buzz a lot. Well, that's really not this winding. When, when this ran, this, this winding didn't vibrate. And somebody has made up the myth on one of these websites that, that welding this causes the core to short and makes it inefficient. That's simply a bald-faced lie. That's done for automation. Otherwise, there have to be holes drilled in each corner and bolts put through. And when those bolts are tightened, it does the same, effectively the same thing as welding. It, it electrically ties all these plates together. This is done for automated manufacturing, and it's done to keep vibration to a minimum. Because when they're bolted, they're going to buzz. But there's, there's magnetic field here, and it's going to vibrate the chassis. But that's minimal. I tested that. But this is a halfway voltage doubler supply, and it's both DC and AC, and therefore the buzz. And it would be very expensive in production to do this to make it nice and quiet. So here's a schematic of the original power supply. A high voltage transformer on the left primary, on the right secondary, the bottom side of the winding is riveted to the core in the middle, the two dash lines. There's the, uh, I don't know, it's 0.85 microfarad, but whatever. 
It's a very small capacitor. 0.85 microfarad and the diode comes off the capacitor and goes to ground. And and the first the first inclination is, oh, that's shorted. Well, if it was short, it would blow a fuse. And by the way, most of the reason for microwave oven fuses blowing is not a power supply fault. It's the monitor switch. The microwave gets old, the monitor switch gets a little sticky, the monitor switch sticks. It's across the AC line for safety. If the door is open, monitor switch sticks. It's right across the AC line and blows a fuse. It's a safety. There were three interlock switches in here. And uh, I only need one for this. So that's fun fact. When a fuse blows, don't freak out. It's probably just a bad switch. But anyway, this is a very simple, inexpensive voltage doubler. But it's not highly filtered. In fact, it's not filtered at all except for a little bit from this 0.85 microfarad. And down here is a basic circuit analysis. On the left, with the top of the transformer winding minus bottom plus, that forward biases a diode. <clears throat> so replace a diode with a, with a line, a short. For the negative half cycle on top, the left of the capacitor is minus, the right is plus, so it charges the capacitor to peak secondary voltage. And there's charges it very quickly. <clears throat> there's no resistance in the way except a little bit in the diodes. Now on the other half cycle, I'm sorry, that's half, that's half the peak to peak voltage. That's um that's charging on the half cycle. On the half cycle with a positive at the top, the diode's open circuit. So that half AC cycle through the capacitor is applied across the load. And here's a little different way to look at it. On the left, the negative going half of the AC cycle with the diode represented as short circuit here, that charges the capacitor instantly minus on the left plus on the right on the opposite half cycle that flips the diodes open and i've drawn a load resistor out there but the top of the transformer winding that's here is plus to minus and by kirchhoff's voltage law now the transformer secondary positive peak is in series with this capacitor minus plus minus plus so that gives approximately that gives neg that gives positive peak ac voltage plus the negative peak if it's filtered to average that's 0 0.637 times so it doesn't give twice the secondary it doesn't give full output peak to peak but it's it's most of it so that's how they get away with using such and that's the power supply. Such an extremely simple and cheap power supply. It works. It's noisy as all get out. There's nothing they can do about it unless you want to really increase the cost of the microwave. So in this power supply, I've floated the negative. I've operated it. It produced 950 volts DC across 2720 ohms load. That's 0.36 amp. That comes out to be about 350 watts. This unit blew a 7 amp fuse in the Variac at 120 volts. That 7 amps <clears throat> at 120 volts AC is 840 watts. How did a, a load in here of about 400 watts? Let's say there's 10% loss in transformer, miscellaneous losses here and there. So let's say this load drew 400 watts. That's only half of the energy that blew the uh, Ariac fuse. Well, no, it's, it's a complete myth that the transformer is lossy and all that. It's a problem of, I'm driving this with a triac. You can see the triac light dimmer. 
there. You can see the triac hiding back here in the background onto this heat sink. And of course, the heat sink panel is grounded back here because a triac can break over the AC line. That's a 1500 watt light dimmer. I just took the guts out. But you see, the triac works on both half cycles. An SCR would only conduct on one. So this with a half wave transformer output and half wave filter is only working into a load for half cycle. On the other half cycle, the track driver is still putting AC line voltage across the primary of the transformer and it's dissipating that extra energy. So when I convert this to a full wave rectified output, that will take care of itself. But it is an absolute myth that, that that is because the transformer is somehow very poorly, cheaply made and inefficient. That is absolutely false. That transformer is designed with good, good laminate steel. All it takes for good laminate materials is a correct, is a correct uh, alloying. This is not a this is not a sixty year old transformer with iron windings. So someone's taken a myth from sixty years ago that the transformer is inefficient and tried to apply it to this because they have no idea what they're doing. The more efficient they make that transformer, the less energy this microwave uses, and the smaller they can make the transformer, and the less expensive. So there's the engineering and cost analysis for that transformer. Now, as far as using this to make a high voltage supply, this is the filtering necessary to basically get so-called pure DC out. You can see the high voltage lead there, automotive spark plug wire, seven millimeter copper core that goes to a load resistor back, back in this compartment. And then the, the uh, tube being tested will be in behind this cooling fan, but uh, it's high voltage to a 2720 ohm load resistor, then to the plate of the tube. And I'll arrange it for uh, a two kV power supply and a kV drop across each. And then, then I can measure both voltages and get the current. But here is the safety necessary when dealing with very high voltages. These are 200 and 380 microfarad capacitors, each at 500 volts. And with seven in series, that was 3,500 volts. It's extremely important, if possible, to have capacitors, electrolytics, rated at twice the working voltage for life. Less than twice, the life's going to be short. I've soldered bleeder resistors across two capacitors. It really isn't required to have one across each cap. This will, this will discharge it. It just takes longer. <clears throat> But notice the insulation. The red insulation is 1 kV rated alpha mil spec wire. It's a buck a foot. Those are 3,500 volt flame proof resistors for bleeders. There's insulation on the resistor leads. The resistors and the wires are both spaced up away from the capacitor bodies. Each capacitor in this string might only have 350 volts across it, but these two bottom capacitors are be at both at each end of the high voltage power supply with two or 2,500 volts across the both of them. And the voltage rating for the capacitor is a spec for the capacitor from terminal to terminal. See the two silver terminals plus and minus. 500 volts is for those two terminals. There's no spec I've ever seen on voltage rating isolation between the two terminals and the metal can with a plastic sleeve over it. So what I've done has put a polyethylene sheet. That sheet's, that sheet's gonna be good for 20 kV. That's, um, I think that's 10,000 sheet. So that's extremely high voltage insulation, but I put that between these two capacitors. So there's no chance of an arc from one capacitor through the can over to the other can to the other capacitor. Because again, those two red wires down here will be at 2,500 volts DC max. Up here where the wires and the bleeder resistors cross over, I've put um, uh, polyethylene strips between them and the metal cans. 
Now the metal cans are when the, and the outer brown plastic are super glued together to give this capacitor back its initial form because I had to form it to fit inside here and still keep spacing between the capacitors and the chassis. And all these caps are glued to that thick polyethylene plate in the background. And then this thick plate goes over top for absolute voltage insulation. There will be no arcing through that. But that way, now that wire there is not one KV rated. That's common hookup wire. That's probably 300 volts UL. So that's all insulated from those cans by that polyethylene strip. And to hold on place, that's 4 KV rated polyimide tape. That's commonly used as masking in the print circuit board world but it will not burn. So if that resistor gets hot, then it will not melt that tape. That I put that tape in a gas flame and it didn't burn. So the, the hot resistor can't melt the tape and then destroy the tape. So the tape is there to help keep the plastic strips in. So what's really critical here is uh, nice smooth solder joints, no hair wires sticking out. High voltage rated resistors, they're 50 cents a piece, they're cheap. The cans for capacitors with different potentials need to be isolated from each other. These two aren't, they're right together, but there's a minimum potential between the two. So not much chance of arcing. And uh, the high voltage lead is a very thick 7 millimeter insulated automotive ignition wire. That, that withstands 35 kV pulse. It'll no chance of arcing unless that insulation cracks and breaks. And in this application, that's very unlikely. Now here's one last interesting trick. After the observation, the transformer in this application was a half wave output is wasting the other half. And I've never, I don't recall ever seeing this done in commercially made equipment, but here's a transformer with a full wave a voltage doubler output, two diodes, two capacitors split. That's not the only configuration for full wave. That's just a, a simple and inexpensive one. But notice in the primary, why would there be a rectifier on a primary? Wouldn't that make the primary DC? No. It makes a primary half wave. There's a switch over the diode to short it. If you want an option to raise and lower the output voltage by roughly 50% to increase the range of the power supply, then use this configuration on the primary. With the switch open, the primary only conducts on a positive half cycle. It's still AC. It couples through the transformer. The top diode forward will charge. But for the negative half cycle, it's blocked. So the negative going diode that's going vertically doesn't do anything. Short that diode, then the primary gets the full AC, both halves, both halves of the wave. And this becomes a voltage doubled output. Now it's not, not exactly quite that simple in reality because when the primary is rectified, then this capacitor does not get charged. Now with the load connected from here to here for the voltage doubler, there'll still be current because this capacitor through the load will charge that when there'll be a current flow. But uh, you might want to put a relay to switch the minus from here to here for half cycle. So you could do that anyway by just taking a load across one capacitor, but you only get half the current. Maybe that's okay. But with the rectifier in the primary, when this is operated as a half wave, the primary isn't wasting energy on the unused half cycle. And there can be a considerable amount of energy. So this is kind of sort of basically the design of switch mode power supplies. It just isn't obvious. So there's a rundown on how the original microwave oven power supply works and how to convert it for other applications. KBYP did it.